Dear ladies and gentlemen, it is a big pleasure to be here today. My talk is about multi-scale and multi-physics simulations using our software package Damask. The work has been developed over many decades with a couple of good friends, such as Franz Rotas, Martin Diehl, Patrick Chandraj, and a number of other colleagues, and I will highlight their contributions as we go along. We all know and appreciate that the global markets for metallurgical and materials products exceed 3,000 billion euros per year. So it's really gigantic. And the properties that characterize these products are often requested at the macroscopic and mesoscopic scale, but the defects are living at the atomic scale. And that creates an inherent multi-scale problem between the defects that create certain properties and the processing that determines the distribution and the final properties. And that makes it a very attractive research topic, namely when we design software tools for quantitative digital twins of such products and processes, we must include the microstructure. Of special interest for us is here specifically the constitutive response of those problems where microstructure and chemistry come into an interplay. And I will show some examples of that. And secondly, we are interested in constitutive forms where multiple mechanisms are in competition and have similar barriers to become activated. Particularly then a proper boundary condition treatment and a good physics-based constitutive description is very valuable. It is clear that mass and energy are conserved quantities but we have to understand that microstructure and properties are indeed not conserved quantities. That means they are amenable to processing and to microstructure tuning. And this also means that any digital twin, any simulation method in that field must be microstructure sensitive. So in a nutshell, I would say that the properties are adjusted through the underlying microstructures. The microstructures are tuned through the processing history of the material and the corresponding mechanisms and microstructure must therefore be included in corresponding simulations. Let me show this in terms of a simple example. This is an overview of the tensile strengths of the white class of aluminum metals, of commercial aluminum metals. When we start with classical pack stream foil that you all know, the 1000 series aluminum alloys devoid of many alloying elements, and we get, for instance, to the 3000 series which are doped by manganese. Then you go up the trend and arrive at the 5,000 magnesium blended alloys used in cars and the higher strengths, 6,000 alloys, which have also silicon uh, that are also used in cars. And then you come to the high strength products of the 2000 series used in planes and the highly stressed parts that we encounter in cars, planes and uh, mobile phone parts and laptop parts, for instance, which contain magnesium, zinc and copper. Then we realize that there's a strong trend in the increase of the tensile strengths as a function of the cross alloy composition. But we also realize that besides the composition trend, you have a very wide scatter bar in the material, as you see here, from here to here, which obviously is accessible to being influenced by microstructure and processing. Let me start with an example from dual phase steel and first visit the microstructure and some of the properties. This is a typical DP steel consisting of ferrite and martensite islands. And the material is highly appreciated in the automotive industry, for instance, due to its high UTS, low yield strengths, good ductility and formability, no Luder strain, and so on. But it is very hard to arrive at materials that combine a good strength with good ductility, because if you just ramp up the martensite fraction or the carbon content of the martensite, you arrive at a relatively brittle material. So that made it quite attractive for a deeper microstructure study, which we then translated into corresponding constitutive laws. So let's look a little bit into the microstructure. Here I take just an austenitic grain and reconstruct from it the martensite that was formed in terms of the uh, packets, and here the last substructure, which was formed during the quenching. This is the same microstructure in electron channeling contrast imaging, where you see the last interfaces in the complex microstructure 
behind it. And that applies, of course, also to the third dimension because morphogenetic microstructures have very complex three dimensional features. Here you look in a transmission electron microscope edge on um, together with an atom probe measurement where you now see the single atoms highlighted here as pink dots, which show where the carbon is particularly enriched at these last interfaces. And realize we, we have here a very high resolution of only 30 nanometers and these individual dots represent individual carbon atoms. This is just to remind us that the underlying microstructures that we need to homogenize are very complex and already here reveal a complex interplay between the mechanical uh, defects such as dislocations and chemistry such as carbon decoration. And this is a very nice experiment uh, done by Jem Tashan a couple of years ago, where he exposed such a martensitive microstructure with a coarse versus very fine mass to a microscopic tensile test in the electron microscope. And you see the very high mechanical contrast between the coarse and the fine mass leads to local fracture. So these are all features that we have to take into account in terms of the microstructure homogenization. Now on the design part, uh, we also have a macroscopic scale to consider. Let me show you an example. Here we see two stress strain curves, one for a DP800 steel and one for a trip steel. And we see that these very long extending stress strain curve of the trip steel should make this material quite suited, for instance, for crash absorber um, capabilities. And that was tested by colleagues at the University in Aachen a couple of years ago in a big uh, research project. And when you make crash boxes out of these materials and expose them to these high rate deformation experiments, then you can see that actually it was not the trip steel that performed better, irrespective of its high ductility, but it was the DP steel that won this race. That at first uh, look appeared a bit surprising, but when you look closer and realize that the loading points in the DP material or also the trip material actually are located below 20% deformation, that you see, then you see that much of the stress strain curve of the strip material is actually not exploited at all for this type of design. So this simple example only teaches us We develop here must not only reflect the tensorial microscopic response, uh, but it must also react to the macroscopic boundary conditions to which a part and its specific stiffness properties are exposed to. So let me say a couple of words about Damask. I start uh, a little bit more from an educational background for those who are maybe not so familiar with the software and give an example how we apply to these DP steels. So first you do, for instance, a detailed measurement of the microstructure and its deformation behavior in the electron microscope. You can reach that with a silicon dioxide speckle pattern analysis that you uh, use for doing a digital image correlation that gives you the local deformation patterns. For that, it is very important to use in-lens uh, electron microscopes so that you do not suffer from topology because otherwise the high mechanical contrast and these materials makes it difficult after some time for the microscope to catch up what is a microstructure feature and what is just a topology change. So from that, you can uh, get the uh, digital image correlation, the local deformations, and you can also do that uh, in three dimensions as I will show you later in more detail. And then you get the strain maps of such microstructures. So that was, so to say, the experimental branch. And on the other side, we, uh, show you now how we translate that into the simulation. So you first render the corresponding microstructures that you measure, for instance, by EBSD and electron channeling contrast imaging into a digital model. So you can render this completely automatic. And then you have different ways to get your mechanical properties of the microstructure ingredients. Here, this is done by an indentation technique where we run through the entire pole sphere with indentation tests and through a forward calculation 
we extract uh, the mechanical properties of each of these phases. However, we have recently also developed more convenient techniques to get the local mechanical crystal, single crystal properties that we need as constitutive input to the simulations. And then you can choose between different solvers. Mainly we use fast Fourier spectral solvers or finer element solvers um, to get the stress and strain distribution, of course. Now, what is behind this kinematics that we do here? This is a classical single crystal experiment that we all know from textbooks, and you see these surface slip steps, and they come, of course, from dislocation shear in this example. And when many such dislocations are penetrating the surface, as you see here, then you uh, can get bigger slip steps that you even can see with the naked eye. And that is, of course, has been derived long ago by Orban um, and has been uh, realized in terms of the micro to macro transition, where shear rate a gamma dot on a certain nee, slip system can be translated uh, to the mobile yeah, distribution that means this surface multiplied by the Burgers vector and the velocity field. So that gives you just a connection between the underlying shear carriers, which can be dislocations, twins, or martensite variants, and the macroscopic properties of a displacement gradient or of a shear. And then, of course, you have the microstructure coming in to the play when, for instance, you encounter grain boundaries, like you see here, this in this in situ electron microscopy observation, where the dislocations are starting to pile up before the grain boundaries and so on. So these are then effects that must be considered in the constitutive homogenization. The same applies here to martensite and austenite. We have that mostly, for instance, in so-called trip transformation you use plasticity steels, where you see you have metastable austenite seen here, and then you have a portion of martensite that grows. And at the tip of that martensite fraction, you see the production of huge populations of dislocations inside of the austenite. And that also shows you that the real strain hardening in these uh, type of trip steels with metastable austenite um, comes from uh, the additional set of interfaces from the strengths of the martensite, but particularly also of these very high populations of GNDs around such uh, transformation tips. Then you have multiple size effects in these microstructures that must be considered or can be considered depending on your homogenization level. Here, for instance, you see in an electron microscopy observation the uh, dislocation semi loop uh, population of the area inside of an existing twin, where you see that the one over R curvature can, of course, only be confined to the magnitude of that twin. So that gives you size effects and certain additional constitutive variants. Now, when you just render this um, a little bit more kinematic and translate it to the so-called uh, Schmidt law that we all know, then you uh, plot the dyadic product between the corresponding orientation factors of the glide plane normal and of the Burgers vectors. And you can, for instance, for the body-centered cubic ferritic microstructure, plot that for 48 slip systems. And then you have the orientation dependence through this simple kinematic form, which can then be plotted for all of the slip systems, like, like shown here for the 110111 slip systems, the 112111, and even for the 123111 slip system. And that fills up your single crystal yield surface that is behind each of these uh, integration points, and that decides which kind of kinematics you have. More discrete with less slip systems like an FCC or VCC with size, silicon content and so on, or uh, with, with many slip systems that makes a single crystal yield surface relatively isotropic, as you see here. So that is, so to say, the single crystal or the crystal plasticity component of the kinematics here. So this was just, like I said, a little bit of a, of a textbook intro. And when you integrate many of these constitutive forms where we don't have the time to go through all of them today, you have in inside Damask the access to the elastic anisotropy where you can use DFT or, or data from the literature. You can consider different phase fraction. You can even couple it to Calvert databases. Uh, then we have the defect dynamics. I only highlighted a very simple form of the O1 equation that translate, translates the local uh, shear to the underlying microstructure to the dislocations or twins. And you can do this for all the different slip systems that is shown here, where the index A stands for a certain uh, slip system. As I showed before, that means at each integration point, you have a single crystal yield surface where these dislocations live 
And then it depends, of course, on the crystal structure, what kind of kinematics you have. And then you can feed in the corresponding orientation that can come from statistics, from X-ray, synchrotron, or of course, from EBSD maps, like I show you here. And then very often we are relatively coarse, for instance, in our simulation scale, then you must pick one of the homogenization models. Um, and there are different isostrain, isostress, um, self-consistent, Taylor type, and so on, different homogenization forms that you can apply to a certain uh, integration point. And recently, we also started to include uh, damage phenomena. I come later back to this. This is mostly done in terms of the variance of the and calm theory of non-conserved uh, phase field variables, which uh, where the integration point can decide whether the, to put the mechanical work into dislocation relaxation or elastic energy or into uh, damage initiation. So this is an old example. Uh, that we always over the decades uh, compare that to experiment. This is a channel dye experiment, pure aluminum. You see in this little movie animation how such an experiment looks like. So you put uh, a very coarse grain, pure aluminum, where you see the grain boundaries highlighted by the black lines into this channel dye apparatus. And then you subject this to a lubricated, very well defined plane strain deformation. And then you can crack, you can take the sample out and crack the by digital image correlation, the local deformation within the microstructure, as you see here. And you see that already in pure aluminum, the heterogeneity of the deformation is, is really enormous. You can see here, just due to the change in crystal orientation, you have some of the grains, like here the rotated gross grain, which was practically not deformed, while the surrounding grains are heavily deformed already in such a test. And that was com compared then to corresponding crystal plasticity calculations to step by step build up the quality of the constitutive laws. We did this later also in a series of three dimensional experiments where we probed the corresponding materials from both sides and uh, did the corresponding simulation and experimental comparison like I showed before. This is just to, to show you that stepwise over the years, we have really tried to very painstakingly compare the simulation always to experimental results and understand which features of the constitutive laws are uh, of interest and which are maybe also of second order. So let me show you some applications coming back to dual phase steel. This is a typical microstructure that you have seen before. And this is a data set as you get it from an EBSD, from an electron backscattering diffraction. So the colors indicate the corresponding orientations. And when you now subject them to the Damask calculation that I've explained to you before, you get, for instance, here, the corresponding stress distribution. And you see a couple of very interesting features, namely very heterogeneous distribution of the tensile stress up to one gigapascal locally. But you interestingly also see compressive regions, which was at first sight a bit surprising. But those often come when you look into the microstructure when a certain area of material is captured between two very highly tensile stressed areas that move towards each other. That means in such a microstructure, which is under tensile load, you can even get you know, locally compressed uh, regions. So that was quite interesting to learn these things. And when you step by step, like I showed before, as a function of deformation, like highlighted here, compare the experiment again to the simulation. Here you see the secondary electron imaging from the electron microscope. Here you see the comparison, the image quality and the digital image correlation showing you the local strain distribution in the experiment. And here you see the corresponding simulation. Then you see that some of the features, particularly those of very high strain and stress contrast, high mechanic contrast are, are captured, but other features are maybe not so well reproduced as you see here or here. They appear quite differently in the corresponding simulations also here and here. So, and the simple answer is that the world is of course here also three-dimensional and not two-dimensional. We have a special technique to probe the microstructures also in full three dimensions. This is a new equipment that we have developed in the group of Stefan Seffra by the help of a couple of very good colleagues, where we have an automatic polishing system, as you see here. The movie has been slightly accelerated. And this automatic uh, polishing grinding system takes the surface off 
of a portion of the material. And then a robotic system takes fully automatically the sample and transfers this specimen into the chamber of the Merlin Gemini electron microscopes. As you see here, so it charges the sample. Then the robot is automatically closing the machine, as you see here. And then the chamber is evacuated. That is all fully controlled by a self uh, develop software package, and then you subject the sample to the corresponding measurements. And then you take the sample out and so on. And then you start over again. And then you get these complex three-dimensional microstructures directly measured from automated uh, serial sectioning. And that gives you data sets like this in full 3D eBSD, including also the interfaces, uh, which are very rich in information, also in the third dimension which is often a feature for high fidelity comparisons between experiment and simulations, um, a missing link that you really need to consider. That is shown, for instance, here on a somewhat older data set taken in terms of the kernel average misorientation and the image quality on a portion of a DP steel. And so when we consider these and again, produce digital three-dimensional microstructures, then you get uh, much more plausible predictions of the strain and stress distribution also for such complex deals in order again to compare the plausibility of the predicted results. And that is shown here with an example where we uh, had a larger portion now mapped, as you see here from a corresponding EBSD calculations. And we, again, we rendered this digital and exposed it then to um, computer tensile test using here the spectral solver. And then you get for larger portions of three-dimensional material, the strain and stress distribution, as you see it here. And that of course is then becoming really interesting for predictions of mechanical response for damage initiation and so on. So that have been mostly work from the theory side from Martin uh, Deal, who is now a professor at Leuven in Belgium. And some of the experiments were done in the group of uh, Jem Tashan a couple of years ago. Now let me jump to the macroscopic uh, scale, maybe to sheet forming, some sheet forming simulations you can do with Damask. So first of all, you can use the package to couple it directly in the form of you know, homogenization models and couple it with systems like Mark and Abacus to do your corresponding sheet forming simulations, where for instance, each of the corresponding integration points is then informed by a homogenization model and the corresponding texture to be directly uh, updated during the simulation. And of course, in some cases, you would uh, prefer to work directly with yield surface approximations. That is a standard, as you know, in sheet forming applications, also in the industry. So we had several projects over the year to use microstructures to uh, calculate by the use of Damas the parameters, the anisotropy parameters of these anisotropic yield surface functions and use those in an updated or not updated form for the corresponding macroscopic sheet forming operations. So I skip here maybe some of the details because most of you are aware with these classical yield surface functions and using a simple isotropic hardening model and so on. And I show you some examples of that in the following. Another approach is of course a coupled procedure where you first take the initial yield surface and then you update the yield surface on the fly. That means you permanently calculate by the use of Damask the corresponding texture changes, but only for certain strain or texture development steps. And then you can update the parameters of the yield surface and by that develop a um, uh, deformation dependent form of the yield surface. And that has been shown here for a couple and applied to a couple of aluminum alloys, the 2000 series uh, alloys in T3 state. And here you must, for such materials, consider the anisotropy, uh, particularly in terms of the crystallographic texture. And not only that, but you must also consider the differences of texture between the surface and the center layers. And here you see the comparison for different yield surface function with experimental and crystal plasticity data. And that is shown here uh, as a function of the rolling direction, the uh, normalized yield stress, and the corresponding Langford value. Now, when you do the same thing and do not only like in the preceding picture, use the central layer texture, which is of course an incomplete 
uh, information because the, you see the experimental data are below the crystal plasticity data. And that the reason for that was not that the simulation is not good, but we use only the central layer texture. But when you use a complete texture, so the surface and uh, center layer regions, which often have from the rolling very different types of textures inherited, then you get a very good agreement in terms of the Langford values and the yield strength prediction. And the same can then be done for predicting also the texture evolution at different parts of the sheet and for the thickness prediction and the local mechanical feature prediction uh, using both the central textures or the complete textures and so on. So that works very nicely when you use the mask as a homogenization or texture tool for on the fly updated yield surface functions or for predicted yield surface by crystal plasticity as a function of the deformation. Here's also another example where you use an integrated abacus damask simulation for a more complex beam bending operation um, by the use of damask, where you can see that locally you can have, using these boundary conditions, really high fidelity and high resolution simulations by using damask. Another aspect that I mentioned before is that, of course, materials contain damage features. And damage simulation, I think, is becoming one of the main tasks for Damask in the next years. This is a little overview, again, staying a little bit with the DP skills. Um, a certain housekeeping analysis of the occurrence and types of uh, delamination and fracture mechanisms in DP steels as a function of martensitic volume fraction and ferrite grain size. This was also a project that was written a couple of years ago by Jim Tashan and his team. And you can nicely see here that there are certain features where the martensite breaks, as you can see, apparently with conjunction with notch effects, and in other cases where you have more classical delamination between the soft pyrite and the hard martensite. And when you calculate and look through microstructures, you find many of such spots that you would like to include into corresponding simulations, as is shown here. But let me show how we do with this. Here's an example how the microstructure and damage can evolve during the Damas simulations. And that has been reached in a couple of projects uh, in collaboration with Pratik uh, Pratik Chantraj, who is now at the University of Manchester, where we developed a coupling between crystal plasticity and phase shift simulations, particularly using the uh, NCAN non-conserved variants of the phase field theory, where you, in the context of a generalized Griffith criterion, can uh, arrive at uh, corresponding NCAN formulations where the integration point locally has to decide in a total energy balance whether it's releasing the energy in terms of elastic, uh, plastic, or damage uh, energy. And that is something that we have now starting to implement into Damas in order to allow the system to really let the microstructure uh, locally uh, develop damage initiation features, as you see here, that can also be calculated in three dimensions. This is only, of course, an appetizer and cannot go deep here due to the uh, time. Um, but this is a very interesting recent development on which we work uh, very intensely. Now, there's also a very important portion of our work where we work on the interplay of chemistry and microstructure, as I've told you before, and also with a generalized form of the phase field uh, part of the theory, including now also the Kahn-Hilliard, so conserved phase field variants together with crystal plasticity. We are now capable of describing the interplay of morphological changes, like here you see a classical decomposition, together with the hydrostatic stresses and the plastic strain evolution. And that is a most recent development that I'm showing here. This is, as maybe some of you recognize, a pellet. That is a piece of iron ore that you would, for instance, use in a direct reduction operation. And we work on this topic uh, in metallurgical projects where we try to analyze uh, how you reduce iron oxides with hydrogen instead of carbon. And when you cut through such a pellet, you realize that these materials have a very complex microstructure. So this, what you see here is essentially iron oxide in the so-called hematite variant. This is Fe2O3. And when you now look at the semi-reduced portion, then you have a very complex non-mass conserving interplay between the iron, the hydrogen, and the oxygen that leads to the redox reaction that finally leads to the reduction of hematite 
through magnetite, through vistite into the iron as a final product. And that is very related to the example I showed you before of the interplay of uh, plasticity, elasticity, and phase transformation. Um, namely, when you now run such a phase field, coupled phase field mechanical simulation here in the computer, then you see that you can really predict the growth of the iron that you see here in terms of the yellow color, and also where the water as a redox product is residing, and the distribution, of course, of the reductant the hydrogen and of the oxygen that you start removing from the former iron oxide. So here the simulation started from the vustite, from the last oxide stage, which is the FeO. This is just another little appetizer and has not even been published, just to show you in which direction we try to move with Damask, namely to also include the interplay of mechanics and of chemistry. Now, one word about microstructure modeling towards the end of the presentation. Uh, this deals more with the question how fine we can run such simulation when it gets into the finer details of, for instance, the texture evolution inside of single grains, when you need such information of inhomogeneity, for instance, for predicting crystallization or shear bands or damage. Here are three different grid resolutions. And now we subject them uh, here first for the coarse grid to a thickness reduction, as shown here. This is the same for the fine grid. And here the third example is for the highly defined grid. And all are about 50% thickness reduction. You can already see that this example really resolves very fine details of the microstructure. When we push this a little bit more forward, now we talk 75% thickness reduction for all three different grids, then you can see that here for the highly refined grid, which we realized by a complex remeshing procedure, that um, you get really a microstructure prediction that is hard to tell from an actual EBSD experiment. Just to make it clear, this is not an experiment. This is a Damas simulation with a very uh, highly refined mesh. But this can be now achieved during um, remeshing procedure uh, during the simulations. This is not yet fully implemented, but it's all in the making. This is just a little bit uh, a blow up of these simulations because it's really stunning how close such predictions are getting now towards fine experimental details. At the very end, I would like to share some very recent ideas that we do with Java Mian Rudi uh, on artificial intelligence in this field. So the question is here, can we use solvers that are even faster than the fast Fourier solvers that we are using, the spectral solvers? We all know that fine elements have their pros and cons. They're very good for certain boundary condition treatment aspects for contact mechanics, etc. But they're of course not very fast, not very efficient. Now the spectral methods have advantages in terms of efficiency and speed, of course. Um, but when you, uh, but they are maybe not always so well suited for a contact mechanical and boundary condition uh, flexibility. But artificial intelligence offers very interesting aspects when it comes to replacing those solvers. Here we recently played with a so-called uh, very modified version of the UNET. The UNET is in principle also a CNN, a convolutional neural network, which however has some memory uh, during the refinement by by subsequent sequence of, of kernel operations to reduce the information and keep some of the complex pattern information that is later refed into the uh, reproduction, into the simulation. And here you see in the top row corresponding to mass simulation just for three different topologies, just purely elastic calculation, nothing really exciting. And you see here the artificial intelligence uh, response just from training the UNET version with many such uh, predictions, arriving at very good uh, high fidelity predictions and much, much faster, up to 8,000 times faster than the spectral solver. We currently work on this very intensely. Here you see another example just with uh, different scalar values for Young's modulus, Poisson ratio, yield stress, and so on. So just different starting microstructure, as you see here. And then this is a UNET prediction. And these are the Damask predictions by using the fast Full year. This is now an elastoplastic problem, so highly nonlinear, as you know. So just for giving you a little bit of a glimpse of what we try to do in the future, namely to also work not only on the constitutive side and not only on the interplay of 
mechanics and chemistry, but also look whether we cannot make the uh, solution algorithm much faster, whether it's finally a complete unit uh, solution or whether the unit has to handshake with final elements or spectral solvers, we do not yet know. This is just to show you that there are really interesting development comings on the solver side from our uh, point of view and experience uh, to compete with fine element and spectral methods. With that, I come to an end. I hope I could uh, show you some of the recent uh, and established features of Damas, the packages in under permanent development, of course. And some of the features I showed you today are maybe not yet fully implemented, but we work heavily on it, believe me. And um, yeah, we have seen that it can deal with crystal plasticity, phase shift problems. We have many users in, in company and companies and in academia with whom we also further develop these things. We have included a couple of recent features such as damage, phase transformation, phase field type of problems. And we have also shown a couple of examples for cross graining, for application, uh, for yield surface predictions, for applications towards sheet forming, but also highly refined, uh, mesh refined simulations that go more into the microscopic space if needed. And with that, I thank you very much for your kind attention, and I would be happy to take questions. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks very much for the amazing talk, Professor Rabe. So now the talk is open for discussion. Do you have any questions? Please raise hand and you can, yeah, Bjorn. Yeah, Bjorn, please, you can unmute your... So, yeah. Yeah, actually, I was more applauding than I was uh, raising my hand. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, yeah, thanks, yeah. But no, I mean, um, I have uh, many questions because many of the fields is, um, I mean, very impressive, uh, obviously. But um, um, many of the problems are problems we also deal with. So it's, uh, it's also very nice to see that this is all um, addressed in the future developments of Damask. Can you say a little more um, about the, uh, maybe two things, the, the um, chemo mechanics is something that I'm interested in. And I know you work with uh, Bob Svensson and so on, I, I assume and others, and we've seen your work there. And maybe uh, you can say a few things about what the challenges are there. And along the same lines, we're also interested in coupling our phase field simulations to CalFAT uh, methods. And maybe you can touch a little more on these two points, like what the, the, the major challenges are that you're uh, seeing there and working on. No. Yeah, thank um, you. Yeah, th th thank you. Thank you for the uh, for the question. Yes, the, I mean the interplay with with chemistry is is very broad. So we have uh, cases where we can just statically blend in some of the of the chemistry when we, for instance, do just a change of the friction force for dislocations with a mean field solid solution model and so on. That can be all done without full phase field coupling. We, however, recognize when you, for instance, even go to say a twin formation in magnesium or so, and we want to be spatially discrete and not just statistical in the description, then it, it paid off nicely by, by using already a phase field model just for the twin formation, you know, which does not even involve the chemistry, just a uh, an Ancan type of, of, of approach. And when it comes to the real chemistry, indeed. Then uh, we have a couple of cases, particularly regarding with reactivity, where, where I see uh, a lot of coming um, gain. Uh, if you start, for instance, from something as important as hydrogen embrittlement, you, know, you, you must solve a multi trapping uh, problem together against a certain chemical potential. Right, And then you must simply solve the diffusion equation and some of these trapping features. And if you apply it, for instance, to titanium or to zirconium and so on, then you have to uh, blend in something like the formation of hydrides. So here you have a full phase field mechanical uh, coupled problem. And I would always say it depends a little bit on the assignment, uh, but I'm really fascinated by uh, problems where this interplay becomes intense. And that is, for instance, as we all know, is would be a battery, a solid state battery, right. where the volume change exceeds 25%.
when you have intercalation, uh, depending on the anode material also, you, you blow this material up and shrink it and blow and shrink. So it means the relaxation that is of course not elastic, it's elastoplastic. You have massive plasticity and porosity in that. The other example, I only showed one slide and I apologize a little bit for just highlighting these snapshots to as, as appetizer of course, mm -hmm. is what we recently go massively into is the field of corrosion on the one hand, I mean, most of our damage is actually not vacuum damage, it's, it's stress corrosion cracking. Most of the damage we see is entangled with chemical interplay, with the role of oxygen plus damage evolution first. And secondly, we do the other way around. That was the example I showed where we reduce the iron oxide now for you know synthesis means without carbon effect and so on. So you have the same thing when you go uh, through the different phases in that uh, iron oxygen phase diagram. You start off with, with hematite, and, the, uh, and hematite is hexagonal. You go to magnetite, magnetite is cubic. So here you go, you have already plasticity misfit. Magnetite to wustite is cubic to cubic. So mechanics is, is slim there. But when you then go to wustite, from wustite again to iron, so just the other way around, like a corrosion, then you have a massive loss of oxygen, which gives you a volume defect of about 40%. So again, a lot of plasticity in one. And that's what I find so fascinating. Reactive chemistry, phase formation, volume changes, and the massive nonlinear mechanics that are then potentially involved, where the point can decide, do I want to fracture? Do I have to fracture? Do I have to create dislocation and so on? And that is fascinating because if you look into the solid state chemistry field, people who develop, you know, the anode the cathode material for batteries or who, who devise reduction processes or whatever in the metallurgical sciences, then these people are often not so affiliated with a consistent mechanical field. So I think we can contribute yeah. something. Yeah, I apologize for many of just throwing many of these points uh, at you, but but uh, in a keynote, I thought I, I show some of these directions, oh, absolutely. which I find really fascinating. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I fully agree that this is no longer just say an academic problem, but these coupling of mechanics and chemistry now appears all over the place and plays a substantial role. And uh, I mean, that's also why we're interested in it. And if I if I may just add a, a, a short uh, follow up question in the same direction, maybe it, let me know if it's too detailed. But I was wondering on like how specifically like what the strategy is to couple Damask uh, to CalFed methods. So, for example, do you use something similar that the uh, Britta Nestler's group uses with this uh, grand potential idea, or is it uh, maybe if you just can say a few words about that, what the strategy is to couple it? Yeah, say say the coupling uh, coupling is uh, uh, indeed yes, we do that. To give you a very specific example, and other groups work on that, of course, also is. Um, more classic, I would say more classical phase field problems, which, uh, you know, include little mechanics at the moment, that would be yeah. something like precipitation free zones, plus the fracture, you know, if you go to a 6000 series alloy aluminum, hot topic for automotive manufacturers, then the preservation free zones are in a commercial sheet, something like 200, 250 nanometers. But if you want to render this uh, really predictive, you need to couple it to Kalfa. There's no, no other way. Otherwise, you simply, yeah. even for the alleged simple ternary, in reality, quinary system of a 6,000 alloy, you need the Kalfa coupling. Now, the strategy uh, is, is indeed that you uh, would either read out the chemical potentials, depending on how your uh, uh, phase field setup is formulated. In some cases, you need to talk to the chemical potentials. And in other cases, you just have to fit the Gibson energies. You know? In the, for instance, very specifically in the simulation that I started to show about the reduction, you know, this iron oxide reduction business, yeah. which is yeah. a lot of fun, I can tell you. Mm -hmm. um, there, uh, we simply fit uh, the Gibbs free energy functions. You know? So that is not fully coupled to Calfat, but we read them out, we fit them to functions, particularly in Wüstheit, you have three sub functions. Uh, depending on the oxide, because there's a systematic 5% oxide depletion. But this is honestly simple fitting and does not directly handshake. But for the aluminum alloys, we directly handshake, and that is then typically chemical potential handshaking. All right, thank you very much. That's uh, I, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. Is there any other question? Let me see. So I have a question, actually, a short question. <clears throat> so in your 2D crystal plus the 
so comparison with the experiments with the large grains in oligocrystals there is a good success for capturing the experiments but when the number of grains are increasing then there are a lot of differences with, between the experiments and the simulations we also had a lot of difficulty with aluminum alloy to capture the experiments uh, that we <laughs> saw. So can you co comment on this? Did you get uh, better results in 3D? What is the main reason in 2D to have this, this much of difference in the strain distribution, et cetera? Yeah, uh, no, that's of course a good question because like I showed with these two or three slides, we always tried particularly in the beginning yeah, to, to be as critical as we can with first order, second order effect check and see how good do we reproduce experiments, um, knowing that we all must be always very careful. We say in our group as a joke, we do not only do bad simulations, we also do bad experiments. <laughs> so what I mean by that is that also real experiments suffer from boundary condition variation or not properly defined whatever friction coefficients and contact conditions and so on. So just saying that also experiments, are of course, not a perfect gold standard. Oh, we have to be careful. And we work very long, therefore, on these idealized channel dye experiments to at least get as close as we can and use really extruded microstructures. Columnar, huge guys, uh, slice them like a piece of bread and then have extruded quasi two dimensions. That worked nicely. And then you can really critically, I would say, really get out all the first order effects. And we were typically very satisfied with that and always helped when something was definitely not reproduced by crystal mechanical calculation and something was wrong, something was missing. And I think that still is valid and makes sense as a, as a procedure when, for instance, you go to elevated temperatures. Uh, no, in, in, at least in our constitutive form, we are often not yet fully uh, happy with how we treat recovery terms in, in things like aluminum or so, which is, as we all know, quite a tricky thing because you get into cell structure evolution and it's not always so easy to capture this in a good constitutive law. So I think it has still a validity to do very simple but very clean experiments on this. Now, secondly, on the 3D thing, I showed this little advertisement snapshot from here from Stefan Zephos group who nicely works on the serial sectioning robotics and their of course, other groups who do that too. There are fantastic groups uh, that do wonderful synchrotron uh, mapping, of course, in 3D and, and neutron mapping. When I look into Paul Dawson's work of the last 10 years and so on, that's, that's absolutely mind blowing. Then uh, you get, of course, real 3D information, uh, which you can better compare. And for me, the gold standard was a little bit the work of Paul Dawson, not, not our own work, because we have post mortem serial sectioning. So we do this large scale serial sectioning, but then the sample is gone. So that means uh, we cannot really screen um, how good the 3D validity is, particularly not in something like BP. So the strategy for us, I can tell is that we, when we really want to have a validity check of constitutive changes, I would always go to very simple single by oligocrystal work to double check what I'm doing. But then at some point you have to trust the 3D simulation or recite to neutron or synchrotron direct mapping. So our serial sectioning is then as a post-mortem uh, not really giving you that answer, I must honestly say, only for the starting microstructure. All right, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you.